Today we're in chapter 40 here in the book of Ezekiel. Actually, we're going to go through chapters 40, 41, and 42. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. <laughs> when we went through the Psalms, there were times when I did not read the entire psalm. I read a verse out of the psalm, maybe two, because if I would have gone through the psalms as I normally do my Bible studies, we'd still be in the psalms right now. And so what I did is I condensed, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm not even going to really read more than the first four verses, but we are going to cover the material that you would find in chapters 40, 41, and 42. So let's begin reading here in chapter 40 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 4, give a prolonged introduction in context, and look for some application and explanation. You'll see what I'm doing in just a moment. But beginning at verse 1 here in chapter 40, reading to verse 4, Ezekiel chapter 40, beginning at verse 1. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. The man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you, declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Basic. Let me give you context and develop, and then we're going to move into our study. Ezekiel supplies us with a date. It's 25 years after he has gone into captivity. It's the Jewish month of Nisan, which would be March or April, and the year is 573 B.C. He has a vision. Now, he may have remained in Babylon. He may have been transported to Jerusalem. It's not clear. But he has a vision from a high mountain. More than likely, this high mountain he's speaking about is Mount Zion, and he's there looking at Jerusalem. As he is there viewing the city, there's a man. This man is... is uh, has the appearance of brass. We know that this man later on in chapter 44 is identified in verses 2 and 5 as the angel of the Lord. And this man has the appearance of brass. It reminds us of judgment. And he's holding materials that are used for measuring. He has flax that was used for longer measurements and the staff that is used for that which is shorter. And as he's there and he's looking at this construction, notice verse 4, it says that the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, Hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. Well, he's about to conduct a tour, if you will, and he's going to conduct Ezekiel on a tour of a future temple. And what he's saying to him is, I want you to use all your faculties to understand what I'm about to communicate to you. I want you to look, I want you to hear, and I want you to understand. And by the way, by way of application, that's exactly what the Lord would have for us today, tonight. I want you to see, I want you to hear, and I want you to understand. And, and it takes, I believe, some discipline to be able to do that. I, I believe when you go through the, the Word of God, that, and you'll see this in a moment, and I'll clarify this even more, but when you go through the Word of God, there are portions of Scripture that seem to just resonate with us, and it's something that we just take to very easily and very naturally. It's easy to illustrate it's easy for us to apply. It's easy for us to understand. There are things that we basically resonate with. And, and so when we get into that passage or the passage is being taught to us, it's something that we're, we're very open to, very receptive to, and, and, and we receive very easily. There are other times, and you see this in Ezekiel very often, that, that what we're dealing with is very difficult to understand. It takes some detail. It takes some, some time to, to, to give information. And, and sometimes I know as a teacher that I begin to lose people at that point because it requires more discipline than the average person might at that time have, and, and, and it's hard to follow sometimes. Well, in this particular case, it's one of the reasons why I decided to just contextualize this, to, to give you some application, because there's so much information here that would bog us down 
that I just have a difficult time uh, doing that. And so therefore tonight, what I want to do is share with you a little bit and, and take these things into mind. You're to look, you're to hear, you're to understand. You're to use all of your faculties so that you might realize the things that God has for you because God wants to communicate. It reminds me of something that Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, when, when Jesus said, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. He said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. And so when you come to the Word of God, you come with this attitude of hearing, you come with this attitude of seeing, you come with this attitude of understanding. And, and what this, the angel of the Lord is saying here to Ezekiel is I have something to show you that you have to communicate. That's what he's saying in verse 4 when he says, declare to the house of Israel everything you see. So I want you to see, I want you to hear, I want you to understand because you have to give this clearly to those that you're about to communicate with. And what he gives to him, and you see this in the following chapters, is a detailed picture of Israel's future temple. Now, this future temple is called the millennial temple. The word millennial comes from the word millennia. Millennia speaks of a thousand years, and it speaks concerning the temple that will be established during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years. Again, we'll look at that in just a moment. Now, this is the millennial temple. In the history of Israel, there are various temples mentioned, and, and you know this because as you read your Bible, you'll see this. You see that, for example, there's a temple that is often referred to as Solomon's temple. We know that as we've been studying through First and Second Samuel, that, that King David had a desire to build a house for the Lord, a temple for God. But because David was a man of war and his hands were full of blood, God said to him, you are not going to be given permission to build this temple, but you'll have a son. His name is Solomon. Solomon is the one who will build this temple, and therefore we refer to it as Solomon's temple. Though, as I pointed out to you, David was the one who supplied the finances as well as the plans for that temple. And in many ways, it's really regarded as being a temple that David had in his heart that his son was able to construct. But you see that Solomon built this unbelievably beautiful temple. And then what happens is that temple gets destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and, and the nation of Israel goes into uh, captivity and, and a few centuries later. And, and then ultimately what happens in 538 B.C., Zerubbabel takes a number, 49,000 plus uh, Jews, and they return from Babylonian captivity. They come back to Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. So you have Solomon's temple, you have a temple that has been reconstructed by Zerubbabel. Later on in the history of Israel, you have another temple that's mentioned. It's, it's often referred to as Herod's temple. It was there during the time of Christ. And Herod constructed or actually reconstructed and refurbished the temple over a period of 40 years. And so you see temples in the Old as well as in the New Testament. You see Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's uh, reconstruction of the temple. You see Herod's refurbishing of the temple. And then prophetically, you have another temple that you see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in Matthew 24, and that is what we refer to as Antichrist temple. And that's the temple that's going to be rebuilt during the uh, seven-year period known as the tribulation. And so as you go in your Bible, you're going to see that there are temples that are built. And the temples that we know of are Solomon's. We see that with uh, uh, the various others that I mentioned to you. But what we're looking at today is a detailed picture of Israel's future temple called the Millennial Temple. And this is the one that's in existence during the time period after Jesus returns in order to set up his kingdom. It's called the Millennial Temple, as I mentioned, because it's built when he reigns for that thousand years. You see that in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And as I was looking at this, I was doing some study on this, and I, I found a quotation uh, one, one Bible teacher said, since the destruction of the second temple in A.D. 70, religious Jews have prayed that God will allow for the building of a new temple on the Temple Mount. This prayer has been a formal part of the traditional thrice-daily Jewish prayer services. Though it remains unbuilt, the desire for a temple is sacred in Judaism, particularly Orthodox Judaism, as an unrealized place of worship. The prophets called for its construction to be fulfilled in the Messianic era. And so this is something that the nation of Israel to this day, the Orthodox Jews, will pray about, that God will once again have a temple to be worshipped in. 
This temple pertains to the nation of Israel. This is a, is a, a temple that is, is for the Jewish people who are believers in Messiah. This temple that we're looking at is not built for the church. This temple that we're looking at is built for Messianic believers. You see, when we go to be with the Lord, we're going to be in what is called the New Jerusalem. And, and John speaks of that in Revelation 21, verse 22, and he says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. We're going to be in a different location. This temple, this millennial temple that we're looking at, is a temple that is going to be used by the Jewish people. And they'll be there for at least what is called the millennial reign of Christ. Now, the temple is going to be built in a very special location. The location is going to be on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is very special, a very special site in the history of Israel. And I want to speak to you about that for just a moment to develop this introduction. And yes, this is all your introduction. Mount Moriah. When you look in the book of Genesis, in chapter 22, you find a very interesting story there. In that particular chapter, God has spoken to a man by the name of Abraham. And God has given to this man a son. The son that God gave to Abraham is named Isaac. Isaac is referred to as a son of promise because it was through Isaac that the promises of God for the future would be fulfilled. Now, as we study the life of Abraham, we note that he didn't have just Isaac. He had another son by the name of Ishmael. And when you look at Ishmael and you look at Isaac, Paul, when he's speaking to the Galatians, you see it especially built up in chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Galatians. Paul speaks concerning Isaac and Ishmael, and he speaks of Ishmael being a son of the flesh, and he speaks of Isaac as being the son of promise. Now, the reason that, that, that Paul speaks in that way is because God had appeared to Abraham and given him a promise and had said that he was going to bless him with a son. But after waiting for a number of years, his wife Sarah, who was barren, had yet to produce an heir. And therefore, she said to him, God will give you the heir through my handmaiden, Hagar. And so Abram actually went into Hagar and through Hagar had a son by the name of Ishmael. And he thought, surely this is how the Lord is going to bless by simply giving to me a son through the handmaiden of Sarah. But God spoke to him and spoke to Sarah and, and made it very clear. No, now Ishmael belongs to you and because he does, I will bless him. But it's in Isaac that you're going to be blessed. Isaac is a son of promise. Isaac is a symbol of, of God's mercy and grace. Ishmael becomes a symbol of man's efforts and the flesh. And so what happens is God has given to, to Abram a son, a son by the name of Isaac. Now, when Isaac was in his 20s, God gave to Abraham a command. God says to him, take your son, your only son, and offer him as a burnt offering to me. Now, when God spoke and said to him, I want you to take your son, your only son, it's not as if Ishmael didn't exist. It's that as far as God was concerned and as far as Abraham was concerned, he had the one son of promise, and his name was Isaac. But God had made it clear that he was going to bless through Isaac, because in Genesis 21, verse 12, God had said, In Isaac shall your seed be called. And so that may have been a bit difficult, maybe even irrational to Abraham, because God had made a promise, and that promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac. And now God is commanding Abraham to take his son and to make him an offering. Now, when you read Genesis 22 and you read the story, Abraham did exactly what the Lord commanded. You don't see any evidence of hesitation on the part of this old man. God commanded him, and he obeyed. After a three-day journey, we read that he left his servants behind with supplies, and he took with him only Isaac. Now, according to Genesis 22, verse 5, Abraham told his servant, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. 
So they came to a prescribed location, and as they came to that location, Abraham pre prepared a sacrifice. The Bible tells us in, in Genesis 22, 6, Abraham took fire, he took a knife, and he also took wood, and he laid it on Isaac, his son. Now, when they got to the site, Isaac spoke to his father. He spoke to Abraham. He said, my father. Abraham said, here I am, my son. He said, look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Little did Isaac know he was the lamb for the burnt offering. And you can imagine for just a moment as, as Abraham looked at Isaac, and he hears his son asking that question. I see fire, I see wood, but I don't see a sacrifice. You can't imagine, I can't imagine, as Abraham was looking at his son, realizing, indeed, you are the sacrifice. I can't imagine what that must have been like. But when he was asked that question, Abraham answered, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Genesis 22, 8. So Abraham came to the place that God told him. Abraham built an altar, and Abraham placed the wood on it. The Bible says he bound Isaac, his son. He placed him on the altar, upon the wood. You don't see any indication there that Isaac in any way resisted this old man. Abraham was well in his hundreds at this point, over 120 years old. Isaac was a young man, could have resisted easily. You don't see any indication at all that Isaac resisted. He simply yielded to what his father's design was. And as he's looking at his son there, Something within him must have just, it must have hit him in the deepest portion of his heart. But the Bible tells us that he stretched out his hand and he took the knife and he prepared to slay his son. The drama of that moment must be incredible to see this old man as he takes this, this knife and as he lifts it above him and he's about to use it to slaughter his own son the angel of the Lord spoke to him. Genesis 22, 12 says that the angel said, Don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked, and he saw a ram, and he offered up for a burnt offering instead of his son. He names this place in verse 14 of Genesis 22, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see, the Lord will provide. Because it says the Lord will provide an offering that will satisfy his demands. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, two things I want to develop with you. What Abraham did was an act of faith, faith based on his trust, God's word. Hebrews 11, 7 through 9 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You see, the Bible says that Abraham was one as good as dead when his wife, who had a barren womb, conceived he figured if God could give her the ability to give birth at her age and give him the strength to be able to produce a child at his, God can do anything. And so the writer of Hebrews makes it very clear that he had done this all through faith. And secondly, this all took place on Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah is where the temple would one day stand. And that's what we're looking at. Looking at the, the fact that God has a history of his temple being there in Mount Moriah. And so this millennial temple that we're looking at is to be built there in that area. Now, I'm not going to go into depth about the measurements, the rooms, windows, doors, engravings, 
courts, dwelling places. I'm not going to go verse by verse, but I am going to attempt to touch on a few things here from chapters 40 through 42. I would encourage you to, if you want to read about how long and how tall or whatever, you know, please feel free, uh, but not right now. I don't want to give you all that information, but I will say these things and then we'll get into a couple of things. One, as you look at this, I want you to know, you'll note this. If you read through this, you're going to notice something. One, you're going to notice that there's no mention of the Feast of Pentecost in any of this because Pentecost has already been fulfilled. Second, you're going to see that there's no reference to the Ark of the Covenant because God's glory will be filling the earth. Third, there's going to be no mention of the high priest because Jesus is the high priest. You see that in Hebrews chapter 3 several times through the book of Hebrews. And fourth, there's no king that is mentioned because the Lord is the king. And so as you look at this, you're going to note that, that there are things that, that will apply. For example, I want you to notice in chapter 40, verse 39. See how quickly we got there? In chapter 40, verse 39, it says, In the vestibule of the gateway, there were two tables on this side and two tables on that side on which to slay the burnt offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. So during that time, there's going to be a temple, there will be sacrifices, and there will be a priesthood. Now, if the believer is the temple of God, if Jesus is a perfect sacrifice, and we are priests, then why is there a temple? That's one of the more common questions. Why is there a temple? Well, the answer would be the temple, the sacrifices, and the priesthood serve as reminders, reminders of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, the first temple pointed to Jesus' future sacrifice. This temple points back to the cross. It's, it's similar, if you will, to the celebration of communion. When you take communion, it, it's something that is both past, present, and still future. And every time we take communion together, we read through 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and, and we read about that. You think of what the Lord Jesus Christ did in the past. You think of what he's doing in the present, and you anticipate what he wants to do in the future. In the Old Testament, you, you have pictures of the coming Messiah, but the New Testament gives us insight as to what he did when he came. The temple, which is called the Millennial Temple, this temple that is found here in Ezekiel, is a temple that will have sacrifices, but the sacrifices and the priesthood and, and, and all of that really relate to what has been accomplished already. So it serves as a reminder, especially for the people of Israel who've come to Christ uh, uh, after the tribulation. I want to remind you of something. If you look at uh, chapter 39 for a moment, Verse uh, 29, I want to remind you of something. God there promised to pour out His Spirit on the nation of Israel. He said, I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my Spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And so the pouring out of the Spirit of God on Israel is something that is connected with the cross of Jesus Christ. The first pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the pouring out of God's Spirit, we know in church history, took place on Pentecost. And so the pouring out of the Spirit was connected with Jesus' death on Passover, and it birthed the church. So here, His pouring out of His Spirit on Israel will be because they have come to faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so they are going to be people who are going to be worshiping the Lord because they have come to faith in Christ. Now, another Old Testament prophet by the name of Zechariah in chapter 12, verse 10 said, and God is speaking, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now, I'm going to share something just briefly with you. When God says, I will pour in the house of David on the inhabit and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, 
Notice how he said, they will look on me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Uh, a Bible uh, teacher, a, a Christian believer, was speaking on one occasion to a uh, high elected official in the nation of Israel and asked the question out of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, speaking to a Jewish individual, said, in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, who is speaking? Again, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. I will pour out. Who is speaking? And the Jewish person responded, God. God is speaking. And that indeed is correct. God is speaking. But the second question was asked, when did you pierce your God? Because when you look at this, it says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. When did you pierce your God? And the answer is when Jesus was crucified. The nation of Israel going through the tribulation is going to be purged. And as they're purged, those who make it through this seven-year period of the pouring out of the wrath of the Lamb, those who are purged are going to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus as Messiah. They are going to have the Spirit of God poured upon them. And they are going to mourn. They're going to be mourning for him because they are going to come to a deep realization of what it cost Jesus Christ to save them. One of the things that I keep asking the Lord to teach me, and I'm sure I speak for us, is teach me not to take your grace for granted. Teach me not to take your sacrifice lightly. The death of Jesus Christ is not something that the believer takes lightly. The death of Jesus Christ, the deeper you get to know him and the closer you get to him, the death of Jesus Christ actually causes a greater depth of sorrow in your heart because you have a knowledge that he died for you. And it has a way of working itself within you to bring a thankfulness and, and also produce a desire for a holy life. It's, it's been said when we go out and, and, and dabble in sin, it, it's like kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Jesus Christ. When we, when we take the death of Christ lightly, we're not growing in our walks with God. When we have this attitude, oh, God's grace is sufficient, no big deal, we haven't understood what it cost for us to be saved. You see, the nation of Israel is going to see the one whom they pierce, and they will mourn for him like you would mourn the loss of your own child. And they will have an awareness of what salvation costs. And, and as they have this awareness of the cost of salvation, they're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. And God will pour his Spirit on them. And the Spirit that's within them is going to produce in them a heart of praise and worship. Notice with me in, in the same chapter in verse 44, how it's speaking concerning some chambers, but in, in chapter 40, verse 44, it says, outside the inner gate were the chambers for the singers in the inner court. Uh, these are people who, who sing praise to God. You see, when the Holy Spirit has filled you, it's natural for you to sing praise to Him. The psalmist said in Psalm 13, verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. In Psalm 95, verse 1, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. You see, when a believer is walking in the Spirit of God, they're filled with joy and desire to worship Him. As a matter of fact, that's one of the earmarks of a Spirit-filled believer, this, this desire to, to know God and to worship Him. When Paul was writing in, in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21, he said to the church there, Don't be drunk with wine, which is 
dissipation or a lack of self-control. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The temple is going to be a place where Spirit-filled believers are worshiping God, and they're going to have people there who are leading in worship. And so a person who's walking in the Spirit is a person who wants to sing praise to the Lord. Now, in verse 47 of the same chapter, it, it speaks of the measuring the court. It's 100 cubits long and 100 cubits wide, four square. And there's an altar that's in front of the temple. That altar is a reminder of the sacrifice. It's a reminder of the sacrifice. The sacrifice in the Old Testament, which were... Uh, a future, a look to the future of Jesus who would be that, that sacrifice and a reminder of Jesus who became that sacrifice. And now, here's your moment of miracles. Chapter 41 and 42, in just a few minutes. What you find, and I encourage you to read this, obviously, but what you find there is measurements as well as descriptions of portions of the temple. You have the holy, the most holy, various chambers. You have rear buildings, interior priest chambers. They're all mentioned there. But you have measurements, and this is really what I want to kind of close with, really. You have measurements there. Um, in chapter 42, verses 15 through 20, you have measurements. Now, the measurements of the outer walls are about one mile square. If you have been in Jerusalem and you have been on the Temple Mount, you know there's no way that the Temple Mount is that, that large. It's not. It's only a, a matter of acres. There's no way that it's a mile, you know, from north to south and east to west. There's no way. And so, this is something that I found interesting here. That reveals that the Temple precincts are much too large for the existing Temple Mount. So if, if the temple that is mentioned in Ezekiel is too big for Mount Moriah, then how is it going to be built? And, and this may interest you. There's going to be a change in the topography when Jesus returns. This is interesting. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move to the north, half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. It says in verse 10 of the same chapter, all the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba, which is about five and a half miles north of Jerusalem, to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be raised. So when Jesus returns, the area is going to be changed. Now here's something. He's going to be the one who builds this temple. One of the things that I have thought about is, now wait a minute, you've got the Antichrist temple. Does Jesus just go into the temple that had been built that was actually used by Antichrist? No, actually what happens according to Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 is this. Speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. He shall be priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. It appears that when this, this change of the topography occurs, there'll be a destruction of the existing temple that has been used and occupied by and desecrated by Antichrist. And Jesus Messiah will construct a new temple. The temple that we see here in Ezekiel called the Millennial Temple. Now, one last thing. Chapters 41 and 42 contain all these measurements and descriptions. And somebody says, this is boring. 
That's part of the reason why I didn't read it to you. This is boring. It's not very interesting. But let's take away something. Though this is not much interest to most of us, something can be learned. What can we learn from all of this? I mean, if you read it, and I encourage you to do that, when you read this, you're going to see this. You're going to see something. You're going to see that in all of the description you find here, God is a God of order. God has design, and God has a plan. And in all of this order, design, and plan, there's a purpose. And that is because God desires worship to be done in a certain way properly. Spirituality, true spirituality, is not something that is determined simply by how you feel about it. I was reading today that kids who are in Sunday school and even tonight children's ministry in elementary age, that George Barna did a survey on, on kids who were raised in the church, and he found that 39% of the kids who went to Sunday school actually genuinely committed their hearts to Christ in their elementary age, 39%. And the number goes down once they turn uh, junior high, high school into high school to the point that up to 90% of those who actually had gone to high school departments as, 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 as kids, when they got into college, up to 90% of them have walked away from what they called Christian faith and have found something else. What's interesting, as Barna was pointing out, it's not that, that young people don't have an interest in spiritual things. As a matter of fact, they do. It's that they have a difficult time believing that the Bible's origin is true and its authenticity and authority is real. And so, what happens is many of them, and we know this, I'm speaking to people who know this, many of them are, are calling themselves today spiritual. And you can do that. You can talk to young people, perhaps you do. And, and, and the word that is used today to describe their religion is, well, I'm not really religious, but I am a spiritual person. And so, what that has done is that has taken the place of being a Christian or even somebody in an organized religious system. Spirituality here in the United States, in other words, is something that's acceptable and even applauded. But Christianity is not. Christianity, when it is rightly taught, is an extremely divisive way of thinking. And, and, and many people, when they hear the actual claims of Christ, have a real problem with it. Because Jesus Christ said, either you are for me or you are against me. Jesus said that. See, we didn't invent that message. You know, when they went out and preached the gospel, they made it very clear there's no other name given amongst men under heaven whereby a, must, a man must believe in in order to be saved. We didn't come up with that. It wasn't, it wasn't the Christian church that said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. It was Jesus himself. And no man comes to the Father but by me. That did not come from some preacher on TV. That didn't come from some revivalist in the 1800s. That came from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. And see, that makes it very difficult because people want to have a spirituality without truth. They want to say all truth is equal, and they'll even say that to you. Well, that's your truth, as if truth comes in a variety, as if like it, it's like you go to the supermarket, and, and, and I feel like buying these kinds of noodles, and you feel like getting those noodles. Well, that's your noodle, and this is my noodle, and they're the same. Well, when it comes to faith in God, they aren't the same. There is either the truth that comes from Christ as the Bible portrays him, or there's a rejection of that. You see in chapters 41 and 42, through all of these dimensions and all that's being presented to you, at least one thing. You can walk away saying, God is a God of order, God has a plan, and God expects worship to be done in a certain way. And that means that I cannot walk in and change it simply because I'm more comfortable with it done this way. I can't even get away with that and 
daily life doing things my way if somebody wants it differently. I'm a married man. I can tell you, I can't get away with it. If Marie, my wife, wants something done a certain way, and I try and give her something else, she's not going to be pleased with it. Now, I'm not one of these mousy husbands who's afraid of his wife, but I can just tell you the truth. She will not be happy with it. That's why I will say to her, it's your birthday, let's go together and you pick something out because I don't want to take it back because every time I buy something, it's not the what you wanted. So I learned that a long time ago. You know what? Your gift is my time. You know, take me into purgatory, baby. I'll spend some time with you in a shopping mall. Give me a cup of coffee and a donut, and I'm fine. Put me on that bench, and I'll sit with the other guys who were in timeout. <laughs> I do that all the time. You ought to see it. They have a husband's bench in all of these stores, and we kind of look at each other. She got you in here too? Yeah, she got me. But it's better doing that than going and buying something and then having to go back and take it back, which I've done many times. Even in the small things, there's the thing that's pleasing and the thing that doesn't please. Why don't we get it? Why don't we understand that God says, there's a way to worship me. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It may seem okay to me, but God says it's leading you in the wrong direction. So, if you take anything out of chapters 41 and 42, and even portions of chapter 40, take this away. God has a special way of being approached, and God desires us to worship Him. But like Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The Word of God gives us truth, and that's how we worship Him. And as you look at the Millennial Temple and all of the dimensions and all of the vestibules and all of the various things that are there, keep in mind that this is for the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation will enter in having memorial sacrifices, looking back at what Jesus their Messiah did. And as they enter into this temple, as Jesus is ruling and reigning on earth for that thousand years, they will enter in with hearts that are touched by God, filled by the Spirit, worshiping God in truth, and they will have a place where they worship Him called the Millennial Temple. We'll be looking more at that as we continue into chapter 43 next time we're together.